let's think a little bit about this concept of replication that is talked about a lot and I think it's very useful especially in a research masters in translation and intercultural studies because when you're faced with the need to complete a master's thesis within quite a short period of time you need to come up with a good topic you need to come up with a method collect data analyze data all of that in a in a very short period of time so it would help if you could build on something that is already in existence and that is what replication is all about it can be defined simply as a repeat of an existing study a repetition of an original study this is what some uh, uh, social scientist in the early 1970s used as a definition of replication but you see that's already qualified as conscious repetition the opposite would be unconscious so you're doing something completely unaware that somebody has done it before now that's what we want to avoid usually by uh, reading reading the literature talking to supervisors you don't want to unconsciously duplicate a piece of work we want to consciously duplicate it want to be aware of what's been done and then we want to duplicate and repeat it uh, systematically and we'll talk about that in a minute what does it mean to repeat a study systematically why would we want to repeat work that's already been done well basically replication is looked at as a test of validity in a broader sense um, we want to make sure that what somebody found is not a fluke it's not an accident but uh, if we repeat the study we will come to the same conclusions we will get the same results it's a way of checking uh, by repetition and I think uh, specifically which it's not only a matter of validity but it has to do more with reliability because if you do a study and you repeat it and you get the same results what we're really finding is not so much the validity but the reliability so upon repetition the same results that is a test of reliability of course reliability is a major component of uh, uh, quality in research and validity is is a broader topic and more complicated because if you do the wrong thing in a study and somebody else uh, you know has the wrong research design asks the wrong questions or the wrong uh, phrasing of questions and they come up with the same results it's reliable but then reliably false results so uh, validity is a broader concept it would mean do the questions that I'm asking really address the issue that I want to understand and does the question fit the issue that would be a matter of validity or construct validity so what we're really checking with the repetition with the replication is at least the reliability of the methods used and the, the way we process the data um, Lassort originally made a distinction between different types of replication he said that you could just repeat the measurements and that's a, a retest replication or an internal replication you do the study once and then you do it again and you should actually get the same results and uh, current thinking now in the literature on replication uh, goes in the direction that you do not want to call that a replication and uh, the thing that has been stressed in recent years is that a replication would imply an independent repetition so not by the same researcher but by a different researcher and then you speak of a, a replication in the sense of an independent replication of an original study um, so this would give us uh, a broader a more current definition again replication as defined by Hubbard and Armstrong we duplicate a previously published empirical study and we basically want to find out whether we get the same or similar findings when we repeat it it's basically a, a rephrased expanded definition the focus is here on same findings or similar findings and just to make sure we know what we're talking about we're basically in the realm of empirical research replication is very much a notion 
connected to uh, empirical scientific work as opposed to conceptual analysis, theoretical research, uh, replication. So we're, we're talking about empirical science. Uh, it, replication has even been referred to as the bedrock of this kind of empirical science. So if we cannot make sure that a study can be repeated, what worth uh, do, would our findings have? So repeatability, replicability is a basic requirement of, of scientific work, or so they say. And we'll see in a minute uh, whether that's always achievable. I'll just come back briefly to the idea of validity and reliability by saying that uh, in terms of uh, our concept of scientific work, we're adopting quite a, a classical view that it wants to achieve validity, but the starting point really is objectivity. We really need start with objectivity in the belief that the kind of research that we do is independent of the person doing it or the place where the research is done. If the, the method or methods are valid and the data um, are, are the relevant, then it shouldn't matter who does the study, you know, the personality, or gender, or age of the researcher, or the, which lab and which university, that shouldn't matter. So objectivity in the sense of independent of the researcher. And uh, then if we do a study like that, we should achieve reliability, meaning, as we said, it should be repeatable. And if we can ensure objectivity and reliability, that is what ultimately will, will ensure validity for our scientific results. Okay. So, so much for the theory of replication and replicability and doing scientific research. And I'm sure that that's the part of the main assumptions that many people have about what scientists do. We, we work by these rules and we achieve solid findings, the truth, basically. We find out what, how the world works. It's not always the case. There are some problems with replication and uh, we'll, we'll look at that. Uh, basically, when we say science and the, our belief in science, it has to do with a certain agreement on how scientific work should be done. And if you remember the seminar given by Daniel Gilles, I'll put him up here, uh, he, according to his material, anyway, I hope that was made available to you or has been available, he talked about the canonical scientific approach, which is what I call the, the scientific process, the scientific method, the canonical scientific approach. And bear in mind that he voiced some doubts about that. He said, this is not the only game in town. There are other people who are sometimes doing other things. And he summarized these other approaches to doing academic work under the heading of human sciences approaches, plural, human sciences approaches. So there, it just makes us aware that uh, it's, again, a choice, an option, whether we adopt the scientific procedure or whether we maybe deviate or are forced to deviate from the canonical scientific approach. In the background, I'll just mention it briefly to that, is a controversy that we've had in the subdiscipline of interpreting studies between what used to be called in the 1990s a liberal arts approach to doing research and an empirical science approach to doing research. Uh, this morning in the seminar, we talked a little bit about that controversy, a question of different paradigms, uh, worldviews in a field of study. So the P here in the abbreviations uh, really stands for paradigm, the liberal arts paradigm and the empirical science paradigm. I won't go into that. There's been a lot of debate about that. So the issue is still with us that there is not only one way of doing science. and. Um, but we don't know exactly how to make the distinction. Daniel Gilles has made a, a big effort in his uh, seminar to bring out the, the distinctions and what is involved. And it's, again, as we will see in a minute, these issues are with us also when we talk about replication. Um, 
I suggest that it has to do with another distinction that is pretty relevant, and that is the distinction between the qualitative research paradigm and the quantitative research paradigm. He rightly pointed out that it's not the same thing, and um, scientific work isn't necessarily quantitative, hmm? but very often it is. And scientific work isn't always experimental, very often it is. But today we'll be talking about survey research, which is not experimental in most definitions, and so it also applies um, to survey research. And he's, we're definitely not only talking about experimental scientific work. So what about this qualitative versus quantitative distinction that I think comes into play when we deal with replication? Let me illustrate this with a few claims that I think could be ascribed to uh, the, the different paradigms or worldviews in research, qualitative paradigm or quantitative. In the qualitative paradigm, the basic assumption is that the world and everything in it is unique, exists only once, is unique. And the way we can perceive and understand the world and everything in it is therefore also unique. And whatever we perceive is always shaped by the unique individual or the subjectivity that is doing the perceiving and understanding. That's one extreme view of, uh, that exemplifies what we mean by approaching the world in the terms of the qualitative paradigm, that everything is unique and special and, and uh, there's no way around the subjectivity of our perception and understanding. On the other hand, we could say in the quantitative outlook on science that the world and everything in it can be grouped by sameness, or at least similarity, and categorized. It's a fundamental process underlying the way we make sense of the world. Categorization, we put things in different categories. So we assume that we can put things together in categories. And since we can do this, um, and applying certain principles, we can achieve intersubjective consensus on these categories. Uh, some things are the same, and we can treat them the same. And we can forget about the individuality that would be involved. We can talk about 11 students in the research masters, for instance. Right? Just count them numerically and treat them like um, quantitative data. There are 11 students, full stop. That's a categorization. And other people might think, well, maybe we need to make a distinction in terms of gender because they're so different and so we cannot lump them into the same category. Maybe male students are quite different from female students. So we cannot form one category that fits all. And if you continue with this kind of thinking, uh, then you end up with 11 individuals with individual biographies, backgrounds, learning experiences, aims, goals, uh, social networks, and uh, if you were uh, a representative of the qualitative worldview, you would think, that's what I want to study. I'm interested in the uniqueness of these students. And if you're focusing, uh, seeing the, thing, the world quantitatively, then you'd say, yes, they're all different and unique, but uh, the heck with it. I want to have numbers, and I want to categorize and put them together in certain groups. So I will. Uh, make do without their uniqueness. Hmm? I think both approaches have something going for them, but if you go to the extremes, you end up with certain implications for doing research. Because if you really believe or focus on the uniqueness of things, or people, or experiences, or events, you find it very difficult to lump them together and count them and, and measure them quantitatively. and uh, on the other hand, and this was really a pretty, uh, pretty lively controversy there, in, in made also mainly in sociology, which way should we go? A more of a qualitative outlook on research or quantitative? And I think by now the controversy has ebbed down a little bit, subsided, and people realize that for some questions, for some problems, uh, we can be pragmatic and say this 
could be dealt with in a quantitative approach. It would give us some useful findings. And other things uh, are so unique that we should adopt a more qualitative approach to research and that we could actually combine the two ways of doing research within the same field of study. Let's say within translation studies, you could have both outlooks. Maybe 10, 15 years ago, uh, this pragmatic attitude was not considered uh, very rigorous or sound. But uh, I would suggest that in our field of translation studies, we have a lot of plurality and we have different approaches that we can allow ourselves the luxury of saying that anything goes in the sense that if it fits our phenomenon and our research question, then we could be flexible and be aware that there is not only one way of doing science, as long as we respect some, some basic rules. Okay, and uh, my point here is here that if we talk about replication and replicability, we're really uh, plunged into the issue of epistemology. How, how is scientific knowledge really created? And uh, there are, as you know, different approaches and they could be aligned with the qualitative versus quantitative approach. Constructivist would mean that we as individuals construct the world and uh, every understanding of the world is unique because our, my mind and my experiences are unique. And on the other hand, neo-positivistic, to use just one of these terms, would mean that yes, uh, we are aware of the limitations of modern science, but there are certain principles and standards and we can do quantitative uh, uh, research and uh, achieve findings as originally intended by natural scientists and then taken over by all those who subscribe to the basic rules of doing empirical research, empirical science. Okay, so the question is, repetition, repeatability, if we adopt an extreme qualitative stance or constructivist stance, we wouldn't even consider replication, right? If we believe that everything is unique, the question is, could, could anything ever be repeated? Mm -hmm. uh, but we won't go to that level. Let's assume we take this middle ground and say, well, in some cases, we think that sameness and uh, comparability do exist uh, to a sufficient extent, and so we can group and categorize and repeat. 